Tonight, the PM promised us he'd grow the economy. Now that we are officially in recession, is that a promise broken? Meanwhile, Labour is mired in the kind of anti-Semitism route it hoped was a thing of the past. And the war in Gaza, of course, rages on. To discuss it all, we're in the historic city of Lancaster, most famous for its role in the War of the Roses and the beginnings of the Tudor dynasty. But our very modern audience here reflects, as always, the electoral picture across the nation. Welcome to Question Time. From the government, Graham Stewart is a minister in the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero. He's been MP for Beverly and Holderness in East Yorkshire since 2005. Labour's Lucy Powell is shadow leader of the House of Commons, a job she's been doing for six months now. Before that, she's shadowed culture, media and sport and has been the Manchester Central MP for over a decade. Drew Hendry is one of the Scottish National Party's 43 MPs at Westminster. The Highland MP speaks for his party on the economy. Jill Kirby is a former director of the Conservative Centre for Policy Studies. She now writes mainly for The Telegraph, most recently critical of junior doctors and the pursuit of net zero. Jürgen Meyer is a leading industrialist and business advisor. For five years, he was CEO of Siemens UK. Now he argues for the green reindustrialization of Northern Britain and is co-founder of Vocal, a social enterprise encouraging business leaders to engage in public debate. Good evening. Welcome to our panellists here. Welcome to our audience. Very good to see you. And of course, welcome to you at home. This programme is available in all sorts of ways on iPlayer, on BBC Sounds. And of course, there's always a lively debate on social media as well. So let's get started with our first question, which is from Brian Mayer. Good evening. Is Labour's biggest challenge to winning the next election the Labour Party itself? So, well, Lucy, I'm going to come to you first. Of course, Labour's got into some difficulty with accusations of, of inappropriate comments, of anti-Semitism. Uh, two parliamentary candidates have been... Uh, well, Labour's withdrawn its support from them. Keir Starmer thought, one assumes, that this was a thing of the past for Labour, but this has still continued to be a problem. Well, look, we, we are a world away from where we were when it comes to tackling anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. And I'm not saying it's now perfect and we've totally... Uh, eradicated it from the Labour Party, but it wasn't that long ago where we had Labour Jewish members of Parliament who needed security guards to go to our own conference. Uh, that was only a few years ago because of threats to their uh, security. And we had leading members of the Jewish uh, community leaving the Labour Party in droves because we couldn't deal with anti-Semitism. We had the uh, Equality and Human Rights Commission come in and say we were in special measures because we couldn't tackle these issues within our party. And we are a world away from that now uh, under Keir Starmer's leadership. He has taken very difficult and long-term and consistent uh, decisions to eradicate that from our party, such that the uh, Equality and Human Rights Commission uh, took us out of special measures about a year ago uh, this week and commended the work that we've been doing, such that people... Uh, like Louise Elman, uh, a Jewish, a former Jewish Labour member of Parliament. She rejoined the party, came to our conference this year. Luciana Berger, a good friend of mine, she's rejoined the party and she's now doing some really important work for us on mental health. So, so we know you... this was a stain on the Labour Party and that's why we've taken the action that has been taken to really eradicate that from, uh, from within our ranks. And are you confident that you will see no more of these kinds of comments from within the Labour Party? Well, you cannot legislate for every uh, utterance of every Labour Party member in every circumstance. But what I do know is No, I'm not talking about every Labour Party member, but let's say MPs, prospective candidates, senior people within Labour. Well, we Are have, you confident we, that you won't see those kinds of I'm confident now? in our processes that mean that people who do found, uh, are found, have said things that are anti-Semitic or have said things that are unacceptable and wrong will be dealt with and will be dealt with uh, swiftly. And we do so, so have very... So, no, then. You, we you, do... you can't say that you're confident. Well, we, we are confident and we but are confident... But you won't hear more that... of these kinds of comments. Well, as I say, you cannot legislate for every utterance that every person makes uh, in every circumstance. Uh, but what I can be confident about is that our candidates are very uh, vetted, very highly vetted, uh, and some, you know... Odd thing, obviously, in this case, gets through 
uh, the net, uh, but we take it incredibly seriously. Keir Starmer has made it one of his key priorities as leader of the Labour Party. And as I say, we are an absolute world away from the stain on our reputation and from, frankly, the, the awful uh, culture and environment that did pervade in the Labour okay. Party many years ago. And we're now a world away from that. Graham. Well, I, I feel sorry for Lucy. I know she has been a stout defender of Jewish people, not least within the Labour Party all these years. And she has to come on here tonight and say what she's just said, that she's confident in the processes. We had, we had the Rochdale candidate come out with the most egregious, appalling and awful racist uh, rant uh, on a conspiracy theory. And the decisive action was to say the leader, and he sent out people like Lucy to support that candidate. I mean, it was utterly terrible. I mean, imagine being one of those people. And then it was only under media pressure days later, and we had to listen to him on the television saying, I've been decisive five times in a minute, which is a pretty good clue when you have... They were also been... claiming new so, comments came forward. Sorry? Labour also claiming that new comments well, came to did it, did it need more than that first statement? I mean, I, I say, you know, I mean, we go back to the lines we have to take. But I just feel sorry for Lucy. I feel sorry for Luciana. I feel sorry for Louise. I feel sorry for all the Jewish people who put their trust in the Labour Party. When they see behaviour like that, it will undermine their confidence. I hope it can be eradicated, but it clearly hasn't been. Labour has not changed despite what Keir has said, and he proved it just the other day. So there's... I think they are back to square one again. That's and what I'd say I mean, to, honestly, what I'd say to the country sorry, is I'm this sorry. country doesn't want to be taken back to square one with Keir Starmer I, and Labour. I, That's I, why Labour is the number no, one sorry, enemy I, I, of its winning the next election. And the more people see of no. the reality, the less likely they are to vote for them. I mean, I ha honestly, I have to... I mean, thank you for feeling sorry for me, but I really don't need your pity. I'm here, you know, of my own volition, saying what I want to say about this uh, topic, and I don't need to sort of take a lecture from you about that. Can, and we can, do... Can, hang you, on a minute. Can you say, hang on can a minute. You say how, how hang on, it took hang on a minute. so long? Hang on a minute. Right, what I will say is that Louise Elman, Luciana Berger, Jewish Labour Movement for Europe, many Jewish leaders who do have confidence in the Labour Party, they've made that clear this week because they can see the trajectory that we have taken okay. over you, the last that point, uh, few, that few years. And obviously there were some comments made, there was a fulsome uh, apology given for that, there was reassurances, there was no further comments that were made. Uh, it was out of character for that person. Then further comments came to light, and that is absolutely where the action was then immediately taken. And it is a big decision to uh, withdraw support for a candidate when a by-election is already underway. This now means that the people of Rochdale, many of whom I know, because it's not that far from where I live, won't be able to cast their vote in the way that they want to, which is to vote uh, Labour. So you can't take these decisions so who uh, else lightly. Was there, Will you come uh, clean on who else look, was look, at the Do you know meeting? what, Graham? I honestly won't take lectures from you because we've had many by asking, we've had many by-elections in these last few years as a result of your MPs going around misbehaving, going around taking money for asking questions in not, Parliament, not going around me, exposing themselves, me, going, me, around, me, going around ex exposing themselves to their staff going around creating mayhem. Chris Pincher, Pincher by name, Pincher by nature, who your Prime Minister said, a by-election calls for that, when your party have stood by those people at who every was, stage, who was stood at by meeting? those people at every stage, who was and we've had meeting? by elections I will not take any lectures who, from you. Can I, can I, I hang on, hang on. Can I also just point out... Uh, that uh, the Conservative Party has suspended a Conservative mm -hmm. mayor and council in Salisbury over alleged anti-Semitic remarks on WhatsApp. So just, you know, just for balance. And who was at the meeting? Is that the interesting question? It wasn't a Labour Party meeting, as you know. There's lots of hands up, and I'd like to hear from the audience, if that's all right. Woman here in the red top. As much as it is nice to hear you quarrelling about who's that and who's that, what I want to know is, as well as you thinking that the processes and how you're dealing with it are effective, why is it allowed to happen in the first place? Because at the end of the day, the comments are still made, the people are still hurt from the comments that are still made, and the trust that Keir was trying to gain in the party as his main mantra, but also in the Conservatives and in the government in general, because quite frankly, who knows what's going to come out of your mouths these days, why is that allowed to happen in a place that should be held of the highest regard in the country? Okay, I will let you answer some of these, Lucy. Mm. I'm just yeah, going to yeah. get around the order. Yes, uh, the, the young man there, yes, in the dark sweater, I think. 
And um, how can you say that Keir Starmer has taken um, a decisive action on the matter when, like has been said, he's waited for um, a media pressure? And are we really supposed to believe that he's going to carry on to take decisive action in other areas when, at the minute, all he seems to want to say is vote for us because we're not the Tories? OK, and the woman further forward in the, in the show here. Um, with all of these comments, you know, all of the politicians have done something and said something inappropriate. Is it not time... Not we all look... of them. Well, no, not, well, not all, <laughs> but, you know, a lot of them. Is it not time we look at the ministerial code and apply it stringently? All right. Drew, do you want to come in on this? I mean, obviously, and it's worth pointing out the SNP has had issues with, with councillors yeah. and, and, and others I'm in MPs. terms of anti semitism Well, the, 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 the wrangles with um, the Labour Party having with the anti Semitism, of course, are, are, are a problem for them um, just now. And, uh, and it clearly, it is a big issue. But the, the thing is, there's no room for hate of any sort. There's no room for anti Semitism in politics, no room for Islamophobia. We should really. <laughs> Be getting beyond that. It, it should be about it should be about what we can do for people. We've got folk in a cost of living crisis just now, and we're talking about issues of um, uh, you know of, of, of that are othering people, that are making people uh, less than they should be. Brian's question was about the Labour Party and are they um, are they their own biggest problem? I would say it goes beyond what we're talking about here. I think it goes to some of the U-turns that they've been making recently as well. The £28 billion a year pledge to invest in green energy, which has just been dumped. It's absolutely um, nonsense for the economy. It's, it's something that should have been done. I know Jürgen in the past has mentioned that's the minimum required every year. And that's for our future. It's for tackling climate change. It's for building industry. And it's an investment. Those are the kinds of things that we should be talking about. But there's also other things like, you know, the rowing back and abolishing the House of Lords and everything like that. When you talk about trust, those are the kinds of issues that I think really do affect people. And that's why I think the Labour Party have got problems with this. And that's why, as they continue to go forward, they'll continue to have it. Unite the Union said, they said that the Labour Party are outsourcing policy to the Conservatives. And that's the issue. Yeah. <clears throat> Is well, Labour's biggest problem in the next election Labour itself? Well, look, I, I do agree with the lady at the front here who was saying that we've had too many of our politicians just, quite frankly, trashing standards in public life, not adhering to the ministerial code, not adhering to the Nolan principles. And, uh, look, Graham, I hear what you're saying. I know you um, are... Um, have high standards in public life, but it isn't very easy for you to lecture Lucy mm -hmm. about standards in public life because we've seen much yeah. from your party that has trashed those principles. So... <laughs> so I, quite frankly, I thought it was quite refreshing when I saw Keir Starmer coming out and saying... I am going to make a decision here. You can argue about the speed in which it was made, but a decision ultimately was made that the MP that was standing in that area behaved in a totally inappropriate way and I'm not going to support you. I mean, I think it's refreshing that we have that sort of leadership leading, sticking up for good, responsible yeah. public order. OK. Jill, I'll come to you in a minute. I'm just going to come and get around a little bit more of the audience. Women at the back in, in the middle with the glasses. Yeah, I'd like to put this to Lucy, actually. Um, I can't believe you can sit there and say that we can trust the management and regulation of things going on within the Labour Party when only recently Keir Starmer has U-turned again on green funding, green yeah. spending, yeah. and it's not the first time. There is a track record now of U-turns within the Labour Party. OK, I'll come back to you. The woman a little bit further forward in the blue sweater. Yes. I, I agree with everything that you've said about the Labour Party, but I think this is across the board and this problem will not go away until we look at the definition of what is anti-Semitism. We can criticise Sudan and politics, we can criticise Indonesia, France, Germany, but you say a word against Israel and you're anti-Semitic. Do you mean a word against Israel or a word against the Israeli government? The Israeli government and Israel, generally. Anti-Semitism is should be about 
a faith and something against Jewish people. I have been in countless marches surrounded by Jewish people shout, shouting things which, if I said, I'd be accused of anti-Semitism and Jewish people could say. It, we've got, it's a political thing and we need to look at that definition of what anti-Semitism is and I think at the moment it's wrong. OK, all right. There will be people who disagree with you, obviously, but I, I hear what you say. Is the person further forward? Yes. Um, so, obviously, anti-Semitism is reprehensible, but the Tory party seems to encourage xenophobia, which should also be equally reprehensible, but it seems to be excused from the Tory party. OK. Listen, let's, let's come to you, Bertha. So, Lucy, there's a number of points being yeah. made, not only about uh, these, these remarks that have been made and, and Keir Starmer's reaction to them, but, but about the point you were making at the back there, about going back on pledges, for example, the £28 billion. Well, look, I mean, the first thing I'd say is, you know, absolutely. Do we need to clean up our politics in general? Yes, we do. Have we had uh, a number of years now where our politics has been brought into, into disrepute by sort of scandal and misdemeanour and misbehaviour? Yes, we have. Not helped by the fact that we've had sort of total chaos in government with the changing prime ministers and the economy being crashed and all of that. So we do need to put more guardrails around standards in politics and cleaning those up. And we have a number of plans uh, to do that. And, and, you know, I tell you now, Keir, Keir scares me because he's so ruthless about some of these things. So believe me, he will do that. But look, on the, on the broader issue about U-turns or whatever, what, what you're seeing from the Labour Party is we have been clear all along what our values are, what our missions are, what our objectives are in terms of how we want to change this country for the better. We absolutely believe that we need to invest in our economy to get our economy back on track. I'm sure we'll come on to discuss uh, the economy. We've got huge ambitions to become a clean energy superpower with huge billions of pounds worth of investment going in uh, over uh, coming years. But the, I mean, the, the, much the, less than you'd originally but the, Much less. The, well, yeah. it, was always sub, it was always subject to those fiscal uh, rules. And what those fiscal rules mean, when the Conservatives have absolutely crashed the economy, we've got stagnant growth in the economy, we've got no uh, oh, head read. We've got no head read. We always have said it was subject to no, those fiscal you rules. You didn't. You we announced did. it as we a, absolutely as a did. spend We absolutely did. We absolutely did. And those fiscal uh, conditions have changed markedly. And what you have to do, when you're in opposition, Position, you have to ad adapt to the circumstances okay. that you All find right. yourself in so that, because I know, just get back to this because I think it's really important. So that, should we be fortunate enough to win the next election, which is, you know, a difficult uh, ask for us, but should we be fortunate enough to win it? What we have committed to in, to in terms of that clean energy superpower, in terms of that green investment, we okay. know for a fact we can deliver right. okay. that. And that is going to help in terms of the reputation of politics as a whole. Jill, you've been very patient. Forgive me for making you wait so long. So I the just... original question is Labour's biggest challenge to winning the next election, the Labour Party itself. Yep. OK, I think I just want to bring us back for a moment to the sheer, to the shocking nature of what the candidate for Rochdale said and he was only known by Keir Starmer to have said it because somebody in the room was obviously so disgusted they recorded it. Uh, but nobody within the room beyond him seems to have taken any action. After what took place on October the 7th, when people were burnt alive, raped in front of their families, babies beheaded, kidnapped, the most horrific terrorist attack you can imagine. If any of you have seen the film, you will have been sleepless afterwards. This was a hideous thing to happen. Absolutely hideous. And everybody... Surely would join in condemning it. The, the candidate for the Labour candidate for Rochdale was said, claimed that that was arranged in effect that Israel gave the green light to that to happen, so they would have an excuse to invade Gaza. Can you imagine supposing people talked in those terms about the Holocaust? Oh well, the Jews brought it on themselves. They wanted it to happen. They wanted to be murdered in their thousands. It's so deeply offensive. It goes beyond anything you might say about other reprehensible things that politicians have done, and we should be horrified. And Keir Starmer's immediate reaction should have been, this is intolerable, this man must immediately be deselected and out of the way. Regardless of what happens in Rochdale afterwards, this cannot happen in the Labour Party. He didn't say that. He waited until there was another leak and decided after much dithering, I'm sorry, Lucy, but you cannot defend and say the Labour Party's been cleaned up when something like that is allowed to happen. And, and there is an instant... <laughs> okay. All right.
Listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on and take another related question. Lots of you wanted to ask about Labour, and lots of you wanted to ask this next question. So so let's hear it from Sophie. Al Khaled. I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Sophie. Yes. Um, with nearly 30,000 dead in Gaza since October 7th, half of which are children, what else do the people there have to endure for the UK government to call for an immediate ceasefire? Yeah. Graham. Well, what we need is an immediate pause, and we need to get aid in, and we need to get the hostages out. And we need, need and, and we need we need to ensure that Hamas, a terrorist organization that carried out the atrocity that Jill just described, that they are no longer running Gaza. We so have to can ensure I just that. Be clear, you, because when you, you talk about we need to call for an immediate pause, and Sophie's talking about why she's there there should be an immediate ceasefire, how do you see the difference? Well, because Hamas is a terrorist organisation. No, no, I'm not asking no, no, that. No, but but how, what's the well, difference in your mind, in the government's mind, between calls for an immediate <laughs> pause and an immediate ceasefire? Well, what we need is an intervention so that we do not have terrorists controlling the whole area who are dedicated to the death of every single Israeli citizen and the destruction of that country. How is that... How could anyone tolerate the atrocity and then the continuation of a, a group who will only regroup in order to dedicate themselves to their fundamental aim, which is the death of every single one of your citizens. That's the situation. That's why we must... Uh, you're absolutely right, Sophie, to highlight, I mean, their level of suffering um, and the need to minimise that, to ensure, as we do, engaging, with the, it, uh, engaging with the Israelis to, uh, to uh, influence them as much as we can, to ensure that they're proportionate in what they do. But what we need to do is we need to get those hostages freed. We need to get aid in. We need to ensure that, uh, that there is... Uh, if, if military action has to continue by the Israelis, that it is done in as proportionate a manner as possible with a maximum preparation to minimise civilian impact. But it is impossible to say that they should sit there and allow an organisation dedicated to the death of every one of their citizens to continue to be in charge. It's intolerable and it cannot be allowed, and, but we must also pressure them to uh, behave in the most responsible manner possible. Drew. These are, these are 30, nearly 30,000 innocent children, women and men caught up in this action at the moment. There needs to be an immediate ceasefire. Did anybody see the footage today of a hospital being attacked and a, a patient is receiving treatment dying in that hospital during the attack? This is a horrendous situation. Lack of food, lack of water, lack of electricity, lack of fuel. People are suffering. They're not only suffering death and privation, but they're suffering from the absolute terror um, that this is imposing on them at the moment. The only way to get aid in, to get things sorted out, is to have an immediate ceasefire. Not a pause, but does a pause mean? But you know Not a pause, a ceasefire. No, let me finish. No, let me finish. What we need is an immediate... What we need is an immediate ceasefire. People have a right to be treated in hospital. They have a right to be able to live. They have a right to get food and water, and those things are being ignored at the moment. We need a ceasefire, and the SNP will be bringing forward a vote on Wednesday in the House of Commons calling for an immediate ceasefire. And I want to see the Labour Party support that. I want to see the Tory party support that. I think everybody should be supporting Do that. Do you think Hamas like. are concerned about their incident? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think Hamas Hamas, Hamas are not the ones who are dying in their droves at the moment. Hamas, Hamas are children, enabling their citizens innocent to Innocent children, <laughs> women and men are dying just now. So what They're do you getting do? injured. So, so, yep. so what do you do about Hamas? Well, you have a ceasefire. You allow proper aid to get in. You have a sustained period Hamas for people. Hamas regroup and rearm. Hamas you, are using the aid. You can't, feed, you can't punish. You can't collectively punish nearly 30,000 people and more. We're talking about millions of people here that are under pressure. You can't collectively punish the people of Gaza for the actions of a group. That then, doesn't make sense. And it's not international group. law. It's, you know, this is a massive breach of international law. This should not be happening. 
it is a ceasefire that is needed so that people can get some normality back. Well, they won't get normality back into their life, but so they can get some no rest back. So, Jill, so Jill, so Jill what's, some rest back. what's your response to Sophie's question there? Is it is that there should be... Israeli children that were killed on October 7th. Why isn't your heart breaking for the Palestinian children that are dying? My heart breaks for everyone who died. Why is the why is an Israeli life more valuable than a Palestinian life? Why? I don't. I don't. Have you seen the videos of let, the babies? Let, 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 let her answer. You've made your point. So if I hear I you, let, let her answer. Relative values. I think we have to be horrified by what happened on October 7th because it was wantonly and in Absolutely. cold blood that those horrible things took place. That wasn't in war. That was a deliberate act. Of, of the most horrible terror. I won't go over it, it again. It was horrific, but, but Hamas, okay, do, do let her answer. Hamas, Hamas built, built their terror network under the hospitals. They know that they can use their, their citizens as, in effect, as, as people, who, to, as, bargaining, as bargaining counters. They have absorbed aid for many years from Israel and spent it on terror. Not power, not food for their people. Israel cannot tolerate Hamas remaining in charge if it's prepared to do things like it did on October the 7th. There's no way about it. Israel have taken all the possible steps they can to get people to move away, but Hamas prefer to have their own citizens in line of fire because they think that's the way to win. I'm afraid they're, they're the war criminals. There should be no doubt about who's in the wrong here. OK, Let, let's hear some more. There's lots of... I know you probably want to speak against it, but there's lots of people with their hands that aren't going to go around the audience. Yes, you've got your hand up there. Yes, yes. Talking about a ceasefire is too short-term. Why is no one actually talking about peace? What is a vote on Wednesday going to do in the UK to stop Netanyahu ruining any hope of peace in the Middle East? I'm the chair of the Lancaster and Lakes Jewish community. You cannot just call for a ceasefire and expect things to stop in Westminster. What good will that do? We need to free the hostages. Fighting needs to stop. Lives need to stop being lost and stop dilly-dallying over fake democracy here and actually have the government in power do something to act for peace. OK. Yes. I guess we have talked a lot and we know there are many horrendous acts uh, happening over there. And for a time being, we agree that Hamas is a terrorist organisation. But as per international humanitarian law, there, there is an act of proportionality. The actions taken by Israel, that should be proportional. We need to see, like, we cannot literally sleep at night once we see the kids killed over there. The point of time at this moment is that all the uh, major powers, UK, United States, they should take some actions that should have a sustainable peace in the Palestine. It's, uh, for the Israel as well, instead of supporting those, we should go for a sustainable peace in that region so that the people of that region, they can live a peaceful life and they have all this, those amenities. I don't know, like, the people who are just saying, like, uh, they are defending the, uh, the acts done by Israel, I, I don't know how they are able to sleep at nights. Like, the, you see the horrific scenes, people just lying on the roads, the small kids, six months, year old yeah. kids, how can we let that happen? Yeah. Woman here in the front. Hi. So, before you said it was rather refreshing in terms of politicians, you know, talking about it, but you, no one can give a clear answer. Like, are we going to have a ceasefire? Are we going to have a peaceful vote? There is never a clear answer from regardless of who you are, no matter if that is Conservatives, SNP, Labour. All we want to know is what action we're going to take in this international stage. We are one of the world leaders in international yeah. peace and security. True. What is next? Can anyone, and I mean anyone, give me a solid answer? I want that refreshing answer. So that was promised before. So when you say no one is, none of the parties committing to anything, are you saying I'm just? Are you saying that the SNP, for example, calling for an immediate ceasefire, that 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 is is is, is a meaningless I, gesture? Is that what you mean? No, or? I feel like a ceasefire in terms it is almost. It's not to say that it's a political statement to garner support. It's not to say that, yeah. but a ceasefire, as we've discussed isn't a permanent option. It's not longevity. We need something in the long term that is going to resolve this. We can't just call a ceasefire. That is not how international law works. You cannot rely 
on the other side to go, okay, hands up, mm. we're in the wrong. But we can't also just go, let's get Hamas out. It's a multitude of factors. You need to approach both as a ceasefire to set that example across the international stage that we have been involved directly, to then move to that direct involvement of removing hostages, to protecting these children's lives. I don't know how anyone can stand there and not agree in the idea of a ceasefire and direct action when you've got people who are younger than me who are just absolutely terrified of what they're going to lose. So, mm -hmm. as a clear answer, yes, a ceasefire would be great, but it is just almost a political promise to garner support. So what is next? What is the longevity I of mean, it? I mean, it is, as you point out, a massively complex problem, isn't it? So, Lucy, what is next? I mean, there can't be a single person in this room who does not want the fighting to end in, 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 in some way, shape or form. Uh, absolutely. How do we get to that point? Uh, absolutely. We all want the fighting to end. We all want to see an end to the needless loss of life that we've seen. We all want to see an end to the famine and the hunger and the uh, tragedy that is now ensuing uh, in Gaza as well. And you're absolutely right. It is an incredibly complex, long-standing, uh, difficult sort of issue, which you know I wish we could sit here this evening and even get to the beginning of, of, of solving. Uh, and to, to do that, we do need, of course, the first step to that is a sustainable, permanent uh, ceasefire. So if we you then were in need, government now, need... Lucy, how would, you, how would you go about doing well, that? Well, yeah, and we, we're or, already... Or, or, or do you think, in fact, you can't really have an influence actually, at all? Well, you, we can. We're an important nation. We're a, we're a permanent member of the UN uh, Council. You know, Great Britain, uh, the UK, we do have an, an important role to it. Obviously, we're not directly uh, involved. But we, we have even been doing that as an opposition party. You know, our, our so leaders have been out there. Hang on. I've just, I just said we need a sustainable ceasefire. If you just let me finish. I don't think... The immediate that, ceasefire. Do you know what? I don't think a single person benefits from you attacking me like that. We're all trying to stop the, the loss of innocent lives here in Palestine. And what I've just said is the fighting needs to stop. We need a sustainable, permanent, real ceasefire. Then we need a political process to get to that two-state solution that has long been uh, what is needed in that region. And that means a recognised... Palestine state that is free and secure. It means an Israel that is safe and secure with the right uh, to exist and not be uh, threatened by its neighbours uh, all the time. And we need a new process to get to that. The, the processes that we've had, the quadrant and the various sort of mechanisms over the last few decades have failed. And that's why we're in the situation uh, that we're in. So you know, we want to see, I think like anybody watching this, this to end and there to be that permanent, sustainable uh, ceasefire. Okay. But really, we're only going to deal with this with a political process to a two-state solution. Jürgen. Yeah. So, so, I mean, so Sophie's limit... point is, how many more people have to die? I'm paraphrasing well, you, Sophie. How many more people have to die before the UK government calls for an immediate ceasefire? So should it be? Well, look, we shouldn't want to wait another minute. It's... It's, exactly. the, the issue in, in this debate is I find that, you know, in this incredibly polarised world we're in, you're always forced to sort of almost have to take sides. And I think this debate is sort of forcing to take sides. And, and I genuinely struggle to take sides. Of course the attack on October the 7th was horrific, evil, terrible. But we're all just looking at innocent people losing their lives on on all sides now yeah. so so i am with lucy you know this this debate here doesn't really move us forward very much what we have to do is encourage our politicians here in the usa in the european union i do think we need some local actors to help whether that's a jordan or a qatar and these people need to come together and work out what is the solution for a permanent peace and to absolutely stop these atrocities, so not one more life, which of course is naive and won't happen, but, you know, let's get those people together and really stop it. And I honestly cannot believe that with all the intelligence that we have in the USA, in the UK, in the European Union, that we can't find another way of rooting out the horrible, terrible Hamas, but at the same time protecting the innocent civilians in Gaza. Okay. All right. Now, this is a subject I have no doubt we will return to, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to park it for now um, and move on to a question, another question that lots of you uh, 
asked about. Before I do, I just want to let you know at home that next week we are in Maidenhead in Berkshire. Uh, after that, we're off to South London and to Croydon in particular. So if you'd like to come and be part of the audience, Maidenhead or Croydon, go to the Question Time website. These are the details and follow the instructions there. And we would, of course, love to see you. Right, let's take another question. From Sanam Saleh. Ah, there you are. With the UK now officially in recession, has the government failed yet another pledge that they made? Right. So we got that news today, didn't we, uh, Sanan, that the, the government is now officially in... Uh, the government, sorry, the UK economy is now officially in recession. Um, second consecutive uh, quarter of negative growth. And that was a pledge made by Rishi Sunak that he would grow the economy. Uh, Jill. Yeah, um, well, yes, it's another thing that Rishi Sunak said he'd do. Um, rather hopeful, I think, when he, when he made these pledges. He's not talked quite so much about them since they've all sort of disappeared into thin air and proved to be unachievable. And we had, we've had some different lists presented. So uh, you're right to be cynical about um, the importance of those pledges. The recession um, is, has been described as a, as a technical recession. Um, the government would prefer to call it that. What it really just means is that the economy is stagnating, which is bad for everyone's living standards. It's, it's bad for our economy generally. Um, it's the opposite of what we need because we are a very high spending government at the moment without the resources to provide for that spending. And the only way we can get the resources other than taxing people um, is to actually grow the economy. Uh, and, the, and the way to grow the economy, interestingly enough, although not everyone agrees, is, is partly to cut taxes, to give people more money to spend in their pockets rather than having, having to hand it over to the government. Yeah. Um, so there are, there that are went well. lots of things... That, that went well, didn't it, when Liz Truss tried it? Yeah. We're all paying the price for that now. <laughs> My, mortgage, Liz, my Liz, mortgage has gone up hundreds of pounds a month, as I'm sure everybody Liz, in the last time she tried that ideology went Liz well. Liz Truss was unwise to offer to suggest that at the same time uh, she'd put a bit, she'd borrow a whole lot more money to subsidise energy uh, bills. You can't do both. You ca you cannot keep borrowing money uh, and and never paying it back. So, so, so Jill, the government says, or Rishi Sunak says, uh, and, and Jeremy Hunt has said previously that the economy has turned a corner. Has it? Well, I, I don't think there's much sign of it at the moment. Um, I think, I think they, they've got to be optimistic, haven't they, because they've got an election coming up. Um, and if it doesn't get any better by then, they know they're toast. I think they're probably toast anyway, because there's such disillusionment in this country with, with what the Conservatives said they would do and what they've actually done, um, that there's not much hope left, I suspect, unless uh, the Labour Party goes on in it the, the way it's done this week. Um, I think it could be none of the above, as far as many, uh, as far as many voters are concerned. Um, but, yes, the, the economy is not in good shape. And we need a thriving economy. We need more people in work. We need to stop importing workers and actually get the nearly 10 million people in this country of working age who are not working into work, into jobs, get people off the sick by treating them in hospitals when they need to be treated and actually have a more, a more vibrant and healthy and stronger and growing economy uh, rather than one that's constantly held back by burdens of debt um, and low productivity. So there's a lot of work to be done, but I don't, I don't, I'm afraid I don't have a lot more confidence in Rishi Sunak to achieve that than in the things that he's promised and failed to do so far. Jürgen. Well, the truth is that it's just not the news today that tells us we've got a technical recession. Um, we have had a, a low growth or a no growth economy for the best part of the last 15 years. Um, I represent business and business investment in this country has been pretty much flat for the last eight years. Brexit didn't help the confidence for business to invest in this country. We haven't invested enough in infrastructure, which helps grow the economy. Things like cancelling HS2 has knocked confidence for the business community even more. And all of that has led to an economy which is flat, not growing, but it's also a low-wage economy. And that's why a lot of people in this country are feeling the pinch, because living standards just haven't, haven't risen. Now, look, the good news is I don't want to be doom and gloom everywhere here, because there is an answer. I mean, we are sat in a university here in Lancaster and we have brilliant universities up and down the country and what we need to do is to invest much much more in the technologies that are coming out of these universities this the skills and we need to invest more in the green economy we need to create new industries I call it creating an industrial strategy and sadly 
this government who I've worked with, I've advised, I've helped create industrial strategies, but actually we've not really managed to get it together. And we've not managed to create this new industrial green revolution or the infrastructure revolution that we need to create. And that's what we need to do more. So the answer is not lower taxation. The answer is invest more in industry, invest more in infrastructure and create more well-paid and, and get that money country. from where you're going to borrow it. Is that what you're suggesting? Well, look, I mean, we're going to have to find some ways to invest. And in the green economy, there is lots of business, private sector people that are willing to invest in this country. What business needs is more confidence, needs more support from the government, needs a long-term industrial strategy. Do you know, we have had 11 growth strategies in this country in the last 14 years. 11. What sort of confidence does that give to business to invest? Well, let's ask And Graham. we need more of that confidence. Okay. And I tell you, we can find the way to so what sort, Absolutely. What sort of confidence does that give to businesses then, Graham? I mean, particularly if we're talking... Yeah, let's talk about investing in green energy and your Minister for Net Zero. Yeah. So you've I, got I, no industrial strategy and you've had 11... Well, Jürgen is a uh, long-standing critic and a, a very good one. Um, and, uh, and I appreciate... Do you think he's wrong? And I appreciate his part. Yeah, he, of course he's wrong. He's absolutely wrong. Well, let's take, let's take the green... He highlighted the green issue. Which major economy, I'll say of the 20 largest economies in the entire world, which one has cut its emissions the most? Hands up. There's official stats a couple of years ago. It's the UK. The UK. the UK, we've cut our emissions more than any other major... Look, Jürgen, I, I didn't interrupt look, you. It's brilliant. Are you interrupt it's me? brilliant. Are you let me finish? But we haven't created enough in of moment. the jobs Jürgen. here that create that green economy. That's the issue. Jürgen, um, we would always like to create more. We have 400,000 jobs created. We've gone from the inheritance of your new Labour friends, was in 2010, was less than 7% of our electricity came from renewables. You know that. You work for Siemens. Less than 7%, just 14 years ago, of our electricity came from renewables. Now it's pushing up towards 50. And what about and Sanam's question centrally, which is, with the UK now fishing in recession, has the government failed to meet yet another pledge? Well, I mean, the, Rishi Sunak said he was going to grow the economy. Well, absolutely, and that, that is the end. What we also knew... But has, what, so no, no, that's no, a broken yeah, promise, then, isn't it? Do you want me to answer that? Well, the no. question is, from Sanam... Has the government failed to meet yeah. yet another pledge? What's the yeah. answer to that? Uh, the answer to that is that we made the top priority, as this audience knows, inflation. If you have, when a year ago, inflation, <laughs> inflation, inflation was 11% a year ago, we said we would halve that. That was the first of the but, pledges. But just it's to be clear, down to, hang on, now down to just, 4%. Just, just to be, just in, in, just fairness, to to, in fairness to Sanna, you're sitting so... So politely and nicely there, sir. I'm just going to try and get your question answered, if, if, if I may. Has the government failed to meet yet another pledge on growing the economy? Has it or hasn't it? We want... <laughs> the, the, the economy went into technical recession, yeah. as you said, in the last so, two quarters so of that year. They've but just which, changed the goalposts. They've just changed no, the goalposts. No, no, I, I still mean, don't know. So the answer is it, it has failed to meet this pledge. It has not grown the economy in the last two quarters. <laughs> okay. So to, to that extent, it answer. has failed the pledge. But the, what we were absolutely clear about is we needed to bring inflation down. And we knew that by tackling inflation for the long-term interests of this country, not the short term, that it would have an impact on growth. And so it has. So why but make the they, But, the, but why, it's why come down to 4%. We're not, we're not... Because it's all about building the conditions for the long-term growth of the economy. That's what we're about. We have a plan to do that. Inflation is down to 4%. We want to go further. But look at, it, look at employment. Employment is remarkably strong. We have an unemployment rate of around half that of France. We have, if you talk about growth, and Jürgen's former employer, of course, was German-owned, uh, which of Germany or the UK has grown its economy most since 2010? No Germany or the UK? It's the UK. Which one has grown its economy most since 2016, since the Brexit decision? Germany or the UK? Do you know the answer to that, Jürgen? It's look, the UK. I, look, I, so, can, so, I can give, so, you, I I can give you another set of years where Germany has grown more than here. The whole point is, is both economies have had pretty low growth. But let me tell you something in terms of earning potential, in terms of average wages, in terms of productivity, in terms of the amount of people working in manufacturing and industry. It's way larger in Germany, and so it actually is also is in France and even countries like Spain. So it's those high-wage jobs that we need okay. much more let's, let's. There's lots of hands up. I want to hear from lots of you. So, woman here in the front, in the green top. Um, 
Yes, just in response to this growing the economy, one of the things that the UK exports a lot of are weapons to regimes like Saudi Arabia, selling them at the moment to Israel. So are we growing our economy on the lives and the blood of children elsewhere? OK. Woman over here. Hi. Um, you talk about the, the economy, and, and we are obviously feeling it incredibly much right now, exactly. but the future of the nation is really on our young people. Um, I'm the president of the Students' Union here in Lancaster, and I have students coming in telling me they can't study because they haven't eaten in three yeah. days. And that is they haven't abhorrent. Eaten th people I, are telling you they haven't yes. eaten in three days. Fiona, I have hundreds of stories. We have a food bank on campus. Tonight we have Supper Club, which is where we give out free meals. We have at least 100, 150, 180 students every Thursday who are desperate for potentially the only hot meal that they'll have that week. We have a food bank that we struggle to fund. Mm -hmm. uh, we can only afford a certain amount of food portions on campus. And this is because students are caught in a crossfire. Universities don't have a funding model that works which means that they are increasingly um, aggressively pursuing international students who don't necessarily have a level of English that's appropriate to be studying here, and they're led here under false pretenses. But in terms of sticking to the economy... Sorry, in terms of... No, sorry, no, no, absolutely. Um, and students are the future of the economy. Okay. If we can't eat, we can't study. If we can't afford our rent, we can't live here. Okay. We need a working maintenance loan model that doesn't increase okay. in line with inflation. We, the government does not prioritise students, and it hasn't in the last decade. Okay. Thank you. Woman with the green scarf. Um, yes, oh, yes, you. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not surprised that Graham is mentioning the inflation, which is the only pledge that Rishi Sunak has actually <laughs> managed to, after everything else out of his five pledges, all of the four other ones he hasn't met. So the answer is yes, he has failed. Mm -hmm. And why not end this horror now and call a general election mm. now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm quite surprised that uh, a straightforward question is hardly been answered. Um, well, I think we did get an answer pledge. in that Graham eventually <laughs> said, yes, to they hadn't met that pledge. Fantastic. So we can move on. <laughs> so, uh, I'm talking about growing the economy. In those two quarters. <laughs> talking about growing the economy, and I like what you said about growing the economy, but each time you talk about growing the economy, you don't... People don't seem to articulate where we get the money from. And one group of people that have suffered in the UK when the government tends to increase spending would be immigrants, especially students that are coming to this country because they contribute a lot to the economy. And now we've seen with the new immigration rules that the Prime Minister has rolled in, it has increased the financial burden on students. Yeah. And in, if we look at, if we compare the UK to countries like Finland, where students are allowed to work up to 30 uh, hours per week, you could understand, and given the fact that the economy is now, we're now in full recession, and given the effect of inflation, even before now, cost of living crisis is high, is it time for the UK to perhaps move to a more progressive means of looking at international students, perhaps allowing okay. them to work for up to 30 minutes, okay. uh, 30 hours per, per, okay. per week? Okay, I hear you. I'm going to bring the panel back to the original question as well, if I may. So, Sam's question, uh, Lucy, I'm coming to you. With oh, the right. UK now officially... <laughs> yes, prepare yourself. Yeah. With the UK now officially in recession, has the government failed to meet yet another pledge? Well, yeah, obviously, the answer to that is clearly yes. Their pledge is, is in total uh, tatters. Um, and it's not just a technical recession. I mean, I'm sure most people in this <clears throat> audience this evening didn't need to hear those GDP figures today to know the reality of our economy in our country, which is that we've seen the biggest fall in living standards ever on record. The biggest fall in living standards ever on record. That is some remarkable achievement of uh, this government. And what does that mean? It means we've all got less money in our pockets, that wages haven't kept up with the prices uh, going up. We've now been hit with interest rates and rents going up, so housing costs uh, are a fortune. What else does that mean? It means businesses, like Jürgen said, businesses don't have enough money to spend and invest, and we're seeing high street shops closing, restaurants closing, businesses scaling back and not being able to pay their employees 
uh, sufficiently. It also means that the government, because we've got this stagnant economy with this massive fall in living standards, the government doesn't have enough money to spend to invest in things like the NHS and our schools, which are the future of the growth in our economy. If people are on waiting lists, we've got 7 million people on waiting lists. If they're waiting for a hip replacement operation or for treatment or to get their cancer treated, they can't work. So we're sick Society is a sick okay. economy as well. And that's why we do need to, to turn this around. And, and Graham can pick the one country, Germany, that is not performing as well as the UK. But France, we are, Japan, we are a, no, Italy, no, just to pick no, three others. No, just absolutely. in case you want some more facts. No, that's not Maybe true at all. Because, because what this government like to do, which is what they're trying to do to the answer to the question, is change the goalposts. But we are growing less fast than all of the Eurozone, than the US. Living standards, so it's only the UK. From, from so what point? If you look at the pre-pandemic uh, living standards uh, that, that were enjoyed around the world before the, the pandemic, it's only... Of the the G7 countries, it's only the UK that has not actually gone back to those living standards from pre-pandemic. The Eurozone is nearly 3% above those. America is uh, over 6% above those pre-pandemic living standards. So when you look at the measures that really matter, which is what is our income and what is the income of our country, we are failing. Okay. And this government has failed to grow the economy. Drew. Yeah, I'll repeat that. The Tories have failed the economy and they should be gone. Uh, the, they, they've, had plan, they've had plan after plan after plan and it's been the same plan, more austerity. When we talk about the economy as politicians, what we're reflecting, or which, what we should be reflecting, but we often fail to do, is that people are facing a cost of living crisis. They're living through this every day with higher rents and mortgages. The higher mortgages, thanks to the mini budget disaster from uh, Liz Truss, uh, we are seeing higher food prices, 26% higher food prices over the past two years, largely because of things like Brexit. And we have a, a, an absolutely incoherent financial uh, plan here. The trouble is it's actually matched by Labour. They're going to look to do exactly the That's same things. Absolute They're nonsense, a, An austerity Jim, agenda, wedded to Brexit as they are, failing to invest in green investment as is needed, even taking that minimum step I mean, that they need to over the green what's, investment what's the, plan. What's the SNP's record invest, in Scotland invest, in, in education, well, in it, health? It, well, what's, your record, about, talk, what's your record in terms reckon, of managing well, money well, actually, let's and the talk inquiries about, that well, are going on that, Let me answer that so, for you, Lucy. You know, the attainment level in Scottish schools for primary schools is the highest that's ever been. For secondary pupil, pupils, it's gone up. That's the ACAS results. These things are no, trotted out you, to try and undermine it. You know that's not true. You know that's not true. What about you? What's about you? Let's talk about Let's go, back, let's go back to the question, the Lucy. Tax Lucy, and people's Lucy, you just accused there. Graham of trying to sidestep the question, and you're trying to do the same here. No, I'm We're just talking about the, the economy you're just accusing me here. Well, let me tell you about. Let me tell you about. Let me tell you about what the no Scotish government are doing in Scotland to help people. We're not only doing things like mitigating the bedroom tax. But we're also freezing the council tax, which is already lower in Scotland than it is across the rest of the UK. So we're taking actions where we have with limited powers to try to do things to help people. But what we'd really like to do is invest in the economy. We'd like to take that money and put it into the green economy, which is one of the few industries that we have. But hang on, Drew, Drew have, and it's in there Scotland, are things that the SNP can do. I mean, you have but levers you can pull in. We this don't have the control. We don't have the power. But you have control energy. over some taxation. We, you can choose what you choose. What you prioritise to spend money we, on, for example, we can, you, we can, people can we go can to university. These, Hang we, on, you can you can choose some of your involved. priorities. We everybody cannot else. we cannot make those macro decisions about the economy. The Scottish government don't have substantial borrowing powers like any other government. You're heavily subsidised by, the, by, the, by well, well, by actually, the government in Westminster. Well, well, this is troped out all the time, and Money's of course, when, over when, from when, every taxpayer in well, England to the to well, the well, let, me pick, let me pick that up at the moment. The seventy five percent tax, the windfall tax, that's going in to support the Tories' plans at the moment. It's coming from North Sea oil and gas. We're producing renewable electricity. All of that down. money... No, I've just said I want Bring to... Bring in more input. Okay. Hang on, I'm just going to say, we've got four minutes yeah. left, and we are yeah. a million miles from the original question, which you did <laughs> answer at the beginning. So I'm yes. just going to call it halt now, because otherwise it's going to turn into some SNP political party broadcast, which I completely appreciate you, you want to do, but I just need to... Well, I'm not getting the chance at it. No, no, I'll give you quite a long time, in fairness, Drew. I, I hope you'll agree. So I just... You're going to have about 30 seconds each on this last question, but quite a few of you asked this, so I'm just going to try and squeeze it in. Sally-Ann Mayer. Sally-Ann, whereabouts are you sitting? Oh, there you go. Right, let's hear from you. 
When can we expect to have a rail system that we can rely on? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, you see? You want to talk about this, but you haven't got long. OK, let's just go around. Jürgen. Well, the truth is, it's going to take a long time. And actually, the reason why we haven't got a functioning rail system is because our politics hasn't thought long term for many decades. So what we need is we need a reset, we need a think, we need to think forward like the Victorians did and think forward 30, 40, 50 years. Sounds impossible for some of my political friends here, but we are okay. confident that as a business community, we want to work with politicians to put such a system in place, right. get HS2 back up and running and make sure we create a proper infrastructure for the UK. Okay. You're getting about 30 seconds each, but come on, uh, when are we going to get trains over ground? There are more strikes announced, actually, recently well, in the I'm, last couple I'm of days. I'm pleased well. to see in my local area the Pacer trains. You remember those kind of <laughs> rickety things? At least they're gone, and we are, and, and I'm up and down on so the what's train the answer? every single week. When well, can we, we expect to have a train service we can rely we're, on? We're seeing significant, we've seen significant investment in the railway. It's still not as reliable as we want yeah. it to be. Um, so what's I, I'm the answer? pleased to say that it, it's continually continuing to work on strengthening the system overall, using technology. So in five um, years' time, say so you were to get into government again, would the people here be able to say, yes, I have seen a uh, significant improvement well, I think in the train we, we, we have seen significant improvements in the quality of rolling okay. stock. We've seen, new, we've seen so the quality yes. of rolling stock has improved and we need to keep working on improving the system Listen, overall to really. deliver for people. Look, I think, I think we all know in this audience, don't we, that we're, we're talking particularly here about trains in the north because they're particularly bad. And if we were in the south, we probably wouldn't be having quite the same uh, conversation. But the, the railway system is broken in this country. OK, so when got, can... When, got, if Labour gets want, into that's power, why we want when to. can they expect a train service they can rely well, on? Well, obviously, you, we can't do it immediately. We can't solve everything immediately. But we, we need to bring the rail system back into public control because we have, at the moment, uh, where, where you have, uh, for example, the which you'll all be familiar with, we have Avanti West Coast talking about the free cash they get from the government because they take... Uh, the government takes all the risk and they take all the profit for their okay. shareholders. So, listen, I appreciate that, that you... So you we've got to completely restructure the railway. OK, I, listen, I, I appreciate that, that you, can't, you can't spend uh, uh, money on everything, necessarily. But, say, for example, you get into power, by the end of a Labour... The first, a first Labour government, who knows if there will even be one or a second one, at the end of a first Labour government, would the people here see a, a, an improvement in the train service? Is that what they should expect? Well, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. OK. We reform, well, you can judge that. We change and Come back to question time in, in four or five years' time. Yeah. Should Labour get into government? Jill, very I think you, I think you've got a better tra train service when, when Asleff stop, stopped calling the unions out on strike. Uh, train drivers are paid way above people working in, in medicine, nurses, lots of people in public services. Train drivers at 60,000 a year and upwards, and they're always striking. They're constantly going on strike with no regard okay. for their passengers and protecting, protecting their interests, not yours. Okay. True. Well, Very quickly. A large, part of my, a large part of my journey down here tonight was on, uh, was on ScotRail, which is the franchise that the Scottish Government have taken back into public ownership. I think that's the way to go. I'd like to see Network Rail being devolved to Scotland as well so we can make an even better job of it. Right, OK. Right. Forgive me for not bringing you in on this, but we, uh, I've just run out of time. But I can see you want to talk about it. Our hour is up. Um, thank you very much, incidentally, to Lewis Whitehead, who has provided the pictures here uh, of Lancaster. Thank you very much for those. It's always very nice to see where we are. And uh, remember, the next week we are in Maidenhead and the week after that we'll be in Croydon. But for now, from question, I'm thank you very much to the panel. Thank you to all of you for coming and putting your questions. And I have to say, putting them in a very well-mannered and respectful way. Thank you for that. And thank you at home for watching. From Question Time, bye-bye.